Honorable Vice Prime Minister, I give you the floor for your lecture on the subject Geostrategic Challenges, Managing the Old While Preparing for the Future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. guests in uh, all your titles and uh, responsibilities and capacities. Uh, dear participants, a new word that I've learned from you, uh, Ambassador Stevens. It reminded me of uh, the, the album of Asterix and Obelix where the galley slaves were addressed as uh, associates. <laughs> and very often using a nicer word is another way to uh, hide or at least to not put too much forward the fact that uh, it's about working when uh, when you're studying but, but let me also add to all those who are now in the marvelous period of their life when they can study it is not going to get any better this is the best period of your life please enjoy it in an auditorium that uh, carries Alfred Cain's name I think it's appropriate to talk about geostrategy or geopolitics, a concept which is uh, all too often associated with Henry Kissinger. And Kissinger served as a US State Secretary from 1973 to 1977, exactly the period when Alfred Cain served as Belgian ambassador to the United States. And I think uh, we can all say that uh, Cain and Kissinger became friends, intellectual soulmates, and uh, when Cain returned to Belgium, he brought a good dose of geopolitics with him to Brussels, and later to Ceres, uh, as the courses taught here illustrate introduction to geopolitics, geopolitics of Russia and Central Asia, geopolitics of the Persian Gulf, geopolitics of Iran, Maghreb uh, geopolitics. It's clear that Cain's uh, presence can still be felt. And as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, I can also add, not only here, when I meet foreign ministers in bilateral meetings or in multilateral settings like NATO or the United Nations, it is clear that very often there is geopolitics in the air. To give just one example, two weeks ago I attended the opening of the 66th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York and I would like to share with you the following quote from the opening address given by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He said, and I quote, we are entering a world of vast and unpredictable changes, environmental, economic, geopolitical, technologi technological and demographic changes. The world's population has tripled since the United Nations was created and our numbers keep growing so do the pressures on land, energy, food and water and he said we must connect the dots between climate change, water scarcity, energy shortages, global health and food security. End of the quotation. Of course pressures on land, on energy, food and water these are all key ingredients of a geopolitical approach to international relations. They are also key challenges which international policy makers have to tackle. Are these challenges new? Well, not really, not really. Let us not forget that some of the major battles during the Second World War were triggered by attempts to control oil supplies. That in 1948, East and West Punjab, to nowadays India and Pakistan, almost went to war over the control over a few local canals. And uh, let us not forget that the Arab-Israeli War of 1967 was largely triggered by fighting for control of the tributaries of the Jordan River. But after a long period of the Cold War, in which in which uh, international politics seemed to be largely dominated uh, 
by an ideological struggle, it is clear that now, in the post-Cold War period, the strategic significance of economic concerns and of control over resources sets the tone more than ever. Indeed, nowadays, geopolitics or geostrategy is back in full swing in academics as well as in diplomatic practice. In that regard, let us take a look at some figures. The world population, ladies and gentlemen, is projected to grow by about 1.2 billion between now and the year 2025, growing from 6.9 billion today to more than 8 billion people on this planet. This population growth will mainly take place in Asia, in Latin America and in Africa. With, let me add this as a special point of attention for a Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs, with an additional 350 million people, which is more than the current population of the United States, 350 million people extra in sub-Sahara Africa. Compare this with the West, to what I call the West, that is to say Europe, Japan, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. These countries will only have only less than 3% of population growth. So 97% of the population growth of which I'm speaking is going to be outside what we commonly call the West. Another set of figures that might interest you. Because of this population growth and of course also because of a shift to Western dietary preferences by an ever-growing middle class in the non-Western world, as more, more and more people are lifted out of extreme poverty, the demand for food, the demand for food will rise by 50% by 2030. So there is not a proportional need in terms of food to be had, it is even more than proportional, 50% more need for food. Another example, demand for fresh water. It will rise, of course. Right now, less than 3% of the world's total supply of water is fresh water. And two-thirds of this 3% is locked up in glaciers and the polar ice caps. To put it bluntly, by 2025, no less than 36 countries with a total population of about 1.4 billion people, 36 countries with so many people in them are expected to experience shortage in fresh water. Can we imagine a world where so many countries will have a serious challenge simply to give one of the basic needs of mankind fresh water? Another challenge if the current trend persists, almost 60% of the world's population will live in cities, which is 10% uh, more than today. Already half of the people on this planet live in cities, but this is going to rise to 60%. And the number of mega-cities will increase as well, mainly in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, putting additional stresses on services and resources. And I might also add, in a more philosophical sense, in the way that people live together. This is going to fundamentally change the way in which we are going to look upon uh, the fact that people live together. If more than half of the world, 60%, live in cities and mega cities. In a sense, my, my own country is becoming a city. Now, talking about resources, demand for energy resources will of course continue to increase, especially in energy-hungry and often all but energy-efficient emerging markets. Take China, for example, a country with a spectacular annual GDP growth rate. Last year, Chinese energy consumption rose by 6%. In 2010, the Chinese economy increased its consumption of coal by 5%, of crude oil by 13%, of natural gas by 18%, and electricity by 13% compared to uh, the year before. Even though one must recognize that China recently made good progress in increasing its energy efficiency. Of course, some of you will argue 
by using new technology, by using new and renewable sources of energy, we will eventually be able to match the increasing demand for energy. It is true that you cannot simply extrapolate the current uh, figures and think that the world is going to go on as if there are no uh, modifications due to new technologies. I agree. True. But such an energy transition is going to take time. It takes time before new energy technologies such as biomass, carbon catch capture and storage and hydrogen fuel cells will be commercially viable. Some studies suggest that it might take up to 25 years before new production technologies become widely adopted. And it will not only take time, it will also take huge investments. These are the investments we will have to make in order to tackle, of course, another challenge with a geopolitical impact, a relatively new challenge on the international agenda, climate change. It will increase the pressure on food, water and arable land and raise the number of climate migrants or climate refugees, if you wish. It is therefore all the more important that later this year in Durban we can take concrete steps towards our common goal of limiting global warming. These geopolitical challenges, old and new, are well known and the figures I just mentioned make them more tangible. But what is even more relevant to me as a Minister of Foreign Affairs is the extent to which these challenges have an impact on the behaviour, on the foreign policy decisions of countries. And that impact is at least threefold. First, several countries, including the emerging powers, increasingly link their national security to increased national control over energy resources leading to the creation of large, state-owned energy firms. Energy policy and foreign policy are thus uh, closely intertwined. And in that regard, I would like to ask a question. We could ask ourselves if our European energy policy, with its strong focus on open markets, on privatization, if it is indeed the right answer to these developments and if it allows us to properly compete with countries who play the game with different rules. Of course, when you take a good look at it, open markets, liberalization, the use of private capital in the use of resources is the smart thing to do, if everybody plays the game in exactly the same fashion. In a game where some play it differently, one has to wonder, and of course, there is a prisoner's dile dilemma in, uh, in this uh, situation. If everybody says, if you're going to be nationalistic about it, I'll have to be nationalistic about it, the sum and the result of this game is going to be poorer than in the case of real cooperation. Hence, the big logic of trying to continue to establish international uh, and uh, 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 all over the planet rules, but if they do not apply, then one has to think twice. I think, uh, secondly, that the rising demands for strategic uh, scare resources could also, of course, heighten competition between states, and unfortunately, in certain cases, this competition could lead to armed conflict. It could lead to what the American professor Michael T. Clare calls resource wars. A clear example is the Sudan, where the highly disputed area of Abyei continues to threaten the relations between Khartoum and the newly independent South Sudan. With no clear path to a resolution of its final status, Abyei, which is disputed because of land, grazing rights and access to water, and thus not only because of its oil reserves, could remain a flashpoint for the foreseeable future. Diplomats and policymakers could and should do more to tackle such resource conflicts, while scholars and students in international relations, such as yourselves, could contribute to a better understanding thereof. I would like to mention three particular fields which figure high on the agenda of the Belgian diplomacy. The first is conflict prevention and conflict mediation. <coughs> 
there is broad agreement, and this was confirmed two weeks ago during the Ministerial Week in New York, that international organizations such as the United Nations should continue to strengthen their conflict prevention capacities. In the face of political tensions or escalating crises, preventive diplomacy, of which mediation is an essential part, is often one of the few options available to preserve peace. It saves lives, of course, and it makes economic sense. The World Bank, ladies and gentlemen, has calculated that the average civil war, the cost of an average civil war, is equivalent to more than 30 years of GDP growth for a medium-sized developing country. 30 years of growth lost through an average civil war. That's the lifespan of an entire generation. And by contrast, of course, prevention efforts can be much less costly. When I have to explain to 18-year-olds what uh, the reason is that democracy costs a little bit of money, I always compare the cost of the European Parliament with a few bombardments, with a few uh, uh, military efforts, and if one sees what the comparison in price means, everybody starts to understand that investing in compromise, investing in negotiation, investing in mediation makes perfect economic sense. It is therefore important that preventive diplomacy tools are optimized. In August, the United Nations published a report to do exactly that. And two weeks ago, it was discussed in the UN Security Council. But one thing stroke, struck me, neither in that discussion nor in the UN itself sufficient reference was made to natural resources as a driver of conflict. I would call this a missing link, a missing geostrategic link in our thinking and action on preventive diplomacy. A second aspect that I would like to mention here are peacekeeping operations. Here the record seems to be more positive. During the Cold War, uh, one has to recognize that it was only, almost impossible to reach an agreement on deploying peacekeeping operations. Immediately after the Cold War, there was something of a peacekeeping euphoria, which regrettably led to an overstretch and to the traumatic experiences of the mid-90s. Remember Rwanda, remember Somalia, remember Srebrenica. Right now, Call me an optimist if you wish, but I think we are notice a more balanced approach to peacekeeping, with more focused peacekeeping mandates, without overstretch and without this terrible veto logic of the Cold War. And there is chance for developing more useful peacekeeping operations. Nowadays, for example, Security Council is increasingly aware that the mandates of United Nations peacekeeping operations should help governments of resource-rich countries to prevent their illegal exploitation from fueling further violence. It is a more nuanced, a more balanced view on the role of the United Nations in such environments. And it is worthwhile to further invest in that. And a good example uh, in that respect, I think, is the United Nations organization mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, MONUSCO the mandate of which explicitly mentioned, and I should say partially because of Belgian efforts, the need to deal with natural resources issues. But more work lies ahead of us to make sure that geopolitical factors are mainstreamed in peacekeeping mandates, not only of the UN, but also of operations organized by regional organizations. A third and a final field of activity that I would like to mention is uh, something which links a word that I've been using twice in my speeches to the General Assembly of the United Nations, and that is about accountability. I very much believe in the value of responsibility, but I'm a pragmatical man. And I think that if you speak about responsibility without thinking of the methods of making people accountable, then you're simply uh, advancing a rhetorical a uh, very nice word, because I believe in responsibility, but especially in international politics, I very much believe in responsibility if it is accompanied with some instruments of accountability. Well, the third and final field of activity that I would, that I would like to mention 
uh, is something that I would like to call geopolitical accountability mechanisms. Since 2000, when the close connection between resource exploitation and the financing of often internal conflicts was for the first time brought to attention of the international community with the publication of the UN report on illicit diamond traffic trafficking and arms procurement by UNITA in Angola, since then considerable, considerable progress has been made. The Kimberley process, a global cooperation scheme designed to certify the origin of diamonds from conflict-free sources is in that respect a case in point. But the challenges are larger than blood diamonds alone. Blood copper, blood gold, blood coltan used in our cell phones and blood cobalt should, could also destabilize and do destabilize already fragile societies. Therefore, more research is necessary and more political courage is needed to shoulder, to strengthen and to focus existing mechanisms such as the Kimberley process, such as AT, uh, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative and the United Nations Global Compact. And I would like to stress the word focus. The mechanisms I just mentioned were first and foremost designed to tackle the illegal exploitation of natural resources and in my view they should remain as the main objective. If there again we're going to use these instruments to overstretch, for example, use Kimberley as a process to ensure, let me uh, give as an example, honest elections, then we're overstretching again. One must focus the instruments for which they are designed. Kimberley is designed to create an environment in which diamonds can be uh, traded in an honest uh, fashion which is not conflict pushing but uh, on the contrary uh, which is uh, fair. If you add a lot of other objectives to your instrument what you're going to obtain besides perhaps a good conscience is the fact that your outreach to other countries is going to fail because these other countries are not going to accept the enlargement of your agenda through something which has been designed on something very uh, specific. And in that respect, I think that one of the lessons, one of the, 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 the advices that uh, somebody like Farid Zakaria is giving about order a la carte, use the instruments for which they are designed and do not think that you can have an all, uh, a fit, one fit all solution for each and every problem that you can imagine. That is a lesson that especially Western intellectuals and Western politicians have to uh, come to understand a little bit better. Because of course we want a world in which a tremendous amount of objectives is important for us. But choosing the right instruments to obtain the individual results is something which is key. In sum, <clears throat> if current trends indeed show that geopolitical resource grab will become more intense in coming years, it is essential that our policy instruments, for example in the field of preventive diplomacy, of peacekeeping operations or accountability, uh, accountability mechanisms, that they closely follow these trends. And I'm convinced that in that regard, much work remains to be done, much work also on the academic, uh, on the academic level. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, so far I have mainly underlined that the geopolitical approach to international relations and to foreign policy is useful and timely. And my own country, Belgium, is probably a quite good example of how the geographical location of a country guides its foreign policy. Belgium's foreign policy is of course to a very large extent influenced by its location in the center of Europe, as a gateway to Europe, and uh, by Belgium being an important economic and transportation hub. In other words, where you stand is where you sit. But let me also express a word of caution. Geopolitics, as important and as relevant as, it might, as they may, might be, cannot explain everything. There is no such thing as one big explanation to understand global politics. And I might also add, geopolitics, as important and as relevant as it might be, should not legitimate or justify anything. Not all conflicts can be reduced to control over land or strategic resources. Not all decisions of individual countries or 
multilateral organizations can be traced back to a resource grab. Geopolitics, ladies and gentlemen, in my mind, is to international relations what gravitation is to physics. It is self-evident and it is a matter of lucidity, but it should not, not be seen as deterministic and it can definitely not rule out or contain the free will of human beings. Just like Michelangelo, who was not paralyzed by gravitation, but on the contrary, used his knowledge of it to learn how to fly. So understand that when it comes to understanding the geostrategic and the geopolitical aspects of a situation, it is a question of lucidity, but it cannot replace the value of human will. Let me give the example of Libya. In February this year, a large number of ordinary, often young Libyans, inhabitants of Benghazi, had the courage to stand up against their despotic leader. And when it became clear that this leader was about to turn Benghazi into a horrible bloodbath, a group of countries, including Belgium, decided to intervene militarily to protect the local population. Ladies and gentlemen, we did not send our F-16 fighters to defend national oil or other interests. I repeat, we did not do that for that reason. Of course, cynical interpretations, they're always available. One can always backtrack a decision of a country like Belgium to participate in such an operation and say it was because of cynical self-interest reasons. I tell you, it is not true. It is not true. We sent our F-16s to put the principle of responsibility to, pro to protect into practice. A principle that states that when governments are unwilling or unable to protect their own people, let alone if they attack their own people, that the international community has the responsibility, even a moral duty, to step in. And that's what we did. Instead of non-interference, we decided for non-indifference. Uh, non we did not choose to be indifferent for the suffering of a group of people. And one might call this naive, but it is the truth. And the cynical version is no closer to the truth than the so-called naive version that I gave you now. Let me give another example, the Arab Spring, perhaps more accurately, the Arab Awakening. How could this series of events, which started in Tunisia and spread to Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Syria, Yemen, how could it be explained using an exclusively geopolitical framework? To me, the Arab awakening shows that in international politics, as in all politics, ideas, norms and values, they do matter. It shows that our universal human rights mobilize people to take the streets to demand accountable government. So I would like to end with the following reflection. It was again Henry Kissinger who said that, and I quote, to act geopolitically is to act in terms of hard-headed power politics cal calculations and not in terms of idealistic global visions. End of the quotation. That foreign policy should be found on a sober perception of permanent national interest. Dixit Kissinger. Perhaps he was right in a sense, but I'm deeply convinced that is, this is only one side of the equation. A foreign policy that does not take into account the national interest is naive, is lacking in lucidity. But a foreign policy that does not take into account ideas, norms and values is sterile. sterile. Foreign policy should not only be econocentric, but of course anthropocentric. And if one of these two legs, the lucidity of geostrategic views, but also the capacity of understanding the value of values, if one of these legs is missing, foreign policy will go nowhere. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.
ready to take some questions. I would suggest not more than three. And I would also ask you, since the Minister has other urgent commitments this evening, that every question should not take more than one minute. So it takes the one, the first one. I go about it right away. Um, we, we are still awaiting some of the results from uh, what is going to become a, a report. So what I'm going to tell you is, is a preview. Uh, let me, looking at the time, uh, concentrate on, on, on a few focal points. First, a lot was known. We cannot say that we did not know that there was tremendous disparity in income. We can, in fact, not say that we did not know that there was tremendous corruption. We cannot really say that we did not know that uh, there were human rights violations. And looking in the mirror, a lot of countries, Belgium included, has to recognize that when it comes to making the analysis of what made people go into the streets and why we did not imagine that two years ago or three years ago was probably a false conception of people accepting things of which we knew that they were happening and through some kind of a strange mental construction we said to ourselves yes but uh, they seem to accept it and in that sense we were not recognizing the thing that we in our uh, speeches said that human rights are universal. And that is one of the first conclusions that I advanced. They are universal. Not only did we say it in our speeches, but the people in the streets of Tripoli, and they proved that it is true. And shame on us for having perhaps said that human rights are universal, but having found a way to, to think that this does not apply to some of these countries. So that's the first, uh, first uh, uh, let's say, introspection, which uh, leads to the, the, the second point when it comes to the analysis. Did we not engage too much with information that had to do with official uh, representatives of a country? Did we engage enough with civil society? Did we engage enough with uh, journalists, uh, with people from, from all kinds of organizations? Thirdly, the third conclusion is that every country is different. That would be the big mistake, if we take it from now, to think that the Arab world, the Arab awakening, is a consolidated uh, bloc. That is absolutely not true. For having visited Tunisia twice, I know that the country where Bourguiba did already a lot of things, and then you had, of course, the, the situation afterwards with Ben Ali, that you cannot compare that country where women have completely different status than in other uh, Arab countries where uh, the, the capacity to, to find some, some elements of, of new growth is completely different than, than some other countries. So our need will be to have a very uh, secure and individual approach. And lastly, I think that we have come to understand that the democratic uh, eagerness, and perhaps there's a little bit of geostrategy as well, one cannot think that people went on the streets because of dignity. That is absolutely true. But to keep the fruits of the revolution uh, positive, one, one will have to take care of the socio-economic needs. Because a hungry, uh, a hungry stomach, even when dignity is in, 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 uh, in, uh, in play, a hungry stomach can also lead to other uh, choices. So there is a need for the European Union and its countries uh, 
to be very much aware that the presence or the, the proximity of uh, these countries make them our neighbors of today and that we need to support the, the economic uh, growth uh, potentialities of these countries if we want to have stable neighbors and democratic neighbors in the future. Who wants another question? Mr. Foreign Minister, my name is Arnest Naivar. I'm, uh, I work for the United Nations, uh, but more importantly for this question, I, I am from Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say that Henry Kissinger disliked small states, and he frankly hated microstates. And he spends a lot of, uh, surprisingly many pages in uh, one of his books on Iceland, and how he, how he the horrible, uh, it stands in the Cod War, so-called Cod War against the UK was in the 1970s, and how the dwarf beat the giant. Uh, now, uh, Iceland is applying for membership in the European Union, and uh, it has a very, they, well, some people say that it could take like, uh, you know, the morning to, to negotiate membership if they would, if, if, if the fishery and issues could be solved. Uh, there is, it is also said, if the Norwegians, which is also another nation outside the European Union in Europe, and a much more important nation uh, than, than Iceland, obviously, for many reasons, um, they, if the Norwegians are asked, are you for or against the European mem uh, membership in the European Union, I think it's now like six, 70 percent mm -hmm. uh, uh, against. If they are asked, what if Norway would become the only Nordic countries, country outside the European Union, then uh, it's 50-50 or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, do you see uh, an opportunity in these negotiations on membership, on catching the big fish, if you catch the, the baits, the small one, Iceland? And would you be favorable of coming and trying to uh, do, do you see this as a as connected issue, first and foremost, and would you be favor uh, uh, sort of uh, meeting Icelandic uh, demands to uh, try to catch the big fish in Norway? Thank you very much. Let me first tell you that I don't see the country of my dear colleague Skarpe as a small fish. Don't see it like that, and I don't see it as a fish to catch another fish. I, uh, as, a, as a head of the Belgian diplomacy, enlargement in the European Union, uh, we do not want to meddle this too much with geostrategic considerations because the view of the Belgian diplomacy has always been that the enlargement process must be uh, merit-based and must be based on the logic of when a country responds to all the, 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 the conditions uh, the, the acquis communautaire, and is to be considered as a country which is ready for accession, notwithstanding the situation of neighbors or, or other countries, not coupling countries to each other, not bargaining uh, about it, and not accepting also the attitude of some other countries, you mentioned too, but uh, some other countries thinking that it is the European Union that is in doing an accession to them instead of the, them doing the accession to the European Union. We have a very orthodox view on no, accession, enlargement is a merit-based logic. Now it is true that your country, Iceland, is already very far thanks to, to EFTA and to the other elements, but let me tell you something from Belgian politics. Sometimes the last, the last few meters are that hard that it, it can take uh, a year and a half. So you cannot say, I have already done all this, and this is not going to take a uh, more than a weekend. Uh, very often, the last part, and you mentioned fishery, uh, let me also mention the financial sector, and I think, let us recognize that the last bit is always the thing that is the, the hardest. So uh, I'm not predicting the speed at which this is going to happen. As far as Norway is concerned, that's a very peculiar situation. Perhaps, perhaps they are absolutely in a, in a, in a, in a very 
favorable position to access, I know that the political elite is not that against uh, accession. In fact, even parties that have a lot of votes from Norwegians not wanting to join the European Union, they privately say, we would like us to be in the club. Uh, but it, it touches upon something you did not mention, but the, the Eurosceptic view in the whole of the European Union is of course a very hard burden for new accession countries to, to, to surpass. And that, but that would lead me too far, is probably the fruit, the, the very uh, bitter fruit of several decades of national politicians that have explained to, to, to their audiences each time that it was good news, it is I. If it's bad news, it's Europe. So we killed the image of Europe through national politics, wanting to send the, the messages of popularity, uh, even when they were fruits of the European Union, uh, making, making uh, as if it was the result of, of national efforts, whilst uh, the bad news was, also, was always uh, a question of, of Europe. And I think that is a... Uh, sort of a mortal sin that we will have to uh, surpass in the, in the years to come. The last question, Professor. Thank you very much for your excellent and stimulating presentation. David Fouquet is my name. I'm with Ceris. Um, you mentioned, I'll focus on one point responsibility to protect. And I do this not to criticize or embarrass, but as a practitioner and scholar, um, how difficult it is to implement. We implemented it in the case of Libya, but almost next door in the case of Syria. Mm -hmm. It seems impossible, improbable. Can you deal with that and explain to us the differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's a very important issue. And I must explain to you that uh, probably for a Belgian who has a strong and long multilateral tradition, the fact that in the equation I will always add the element of legitimacy by a decision of the United Nations explains something which is harder to explain than uh, by, by President Obama. President Obama, in his speech about Libya, spoke about the need to intervene and speaking also about the legitimacy of having Arab countries uh, join the, the efforts, but he kept the right to act unilaterally which is a long-standing uh, American view on things. They, they keep the right, they reserve themselves the right to do it unilaterally. For the Belgians, that is not the case. I'm going to be very clear also to my own Belgian audience. Belgium cannot imagine participating in a military conflict, even under the logic of responsibility to protect, if there is not a legitimacy by a decision of the United Nations. For us, this is a crucial ingredient. Of course, in the eyes of everybody with an honest view, this must lead in some kinds to a situation where you say, in comparable situations, you do different things. But the, comparable, the comparability is not there. If I see that in a, in a clear situation of, of Libya, we have the support of the regional environment of the Arab League. And we have a political uh, reality that neither China, neither Russia, neither India, they do not oppose. Abstention is not the same as voting in favor, but at least the abstention of these countries made it possible to decide that the Euro United Nations had a mandate. For us, this is crucial. Which means, and I understand your question, does uh, somebody who's killed in the streets of Damascus, is that, is that different than somebody who's killed in the streets of Tripoli for the exactly the same reasons? Of course, I'm going to say as a national politician, there is no, no difference. But in the capacity of the world to react, I do accept, as a real politician, I do accept 
that there is a different situation when I have Resolution 1973 and when I do not have it. The only thing that I accept as a, a, a remark towards that situation is if you know that to be true and if you think that the situation in another country is as serious as in the country where you have intervened, it is your moral responsibility to go and explain this to the people that you have to convince. And I can tell you that at my level I do that. When I was in New York, I had bilaterals with, with uh, my colleagues of the United Arab Emirates and uh, of some of the other colleagues to explain that in our, in our uh, view, the need to act was also important in some of the other situations. Now, this being said, I know that when it comes to gradually improving the international uh, um, uh, tools, that the decision on Resolution 1973, which authorized intervention in Libya, is a very important thing and it, it is worthwhile not to lose that progress. I w was in New York and heard uh, Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Russia, explain that in his view, 1973, there had been some trickery. There had been some trickery. And in next time, he would not be as lenient as the, the previous time. That is one thing that needs to preoccupy us very much. But do understand that for a Belgian politician, multilateralism is that important. We, we are a country, if we are in a unilateral world, we know what that gives. In a unilateral, in a unilateral world where people or countries can choose to occupy other countries, we know what happens with Belgium. It happened far too much in our history. So we're in the logic of saying military use is to be reserved in the case of uh, uh, such a legitimate mandate. But I understand your, your dilemma and it is something that, uh, well, I'm a good sleeper. But uh, if there are things that keep me awake, it's that kind of uh, uh, situation. <laughs>